But when you were on the base paths, looking into the stands, and catching your father's eye, and the two of you locked, and it was an incredible field of dreams-like moment during the World Series. I'd say in a lot of ways it was. Uh, and it wasn't something that was premeditated. I, I uh, hit a home run. I think it was my third at bat in that sixth game of the World Series. And, uh, you know, I'd already had a triple early in the game, and I'm just kind of shaking my head in disbelief at how well just things have gone, you know, and kind of sinking in. I'm running second base, and just almost instantaneously, I think, you know, my family's sitting down the left field line. So I just kind of pop my head up down that direction, and sure enough, you know, I catch everybody's eye, including my dad's, and uh, I didn't do any Kurt Pavaco spins. Or, uh, That's any, not like you, anyway. You know, but it was just a little moment uh, in that little home run trot that sticks out in my mind, and I put my head back down and finished it around the bases, knowing that that was going to be something that was going to provide a very special memory. What do you think in that one millisecond you were sending to your dad, uh, if you could articulate all those years and all those memories? Well, I, I know how much uh, it's meant to him to be able to, to follow the career and uh, the support he's given me. And I think as I was feeling the first 180 feet around the bases that this is just unbelievable how this is working out. And then to, it was like at that moment I got to share that with him, how I was feeling. And mm. I think he knew that I was feeling the same thing. Mm. Almost a cathartic moment. Sure. Let's talk about the home run. You're on base at second. Uh, you thought about winning the game yourself in your brain. Right. Er, Actually, not at first. Right. At first base, right. right. But you had thought about maybe I can win the game if I had a home run. No, no, just play, play it low, play it low key. And then Joe gets the ball and he hits the ball uh, out of the park. Sure. And you cross home plate and then he crosses home plate. What did he say to you? Well, uh, you know, first of all, like you said, I'm on deck, and Devon White's up after Ricky is let off at the walk, and, and uh, he makes a good at bat and flies out. And, I'm, and like you said, you know, you, when you're growing up in the schoolyard and playing ball, you say, someday you like have a chance to hit a World Series home run to win it. And that's exactly what I was facing. But I fought that off and tried to get a base hit. And then Joe hits the home run, and uh, naturally, around the bases, it's just bedlam. And I get to home plate, and... Uh, kind of joining the celebration and Joe finally gets in and he definitely embraced me and, and let me know that uh, how much it meant for him to see me win and in a lot of ways it was for me. This one's for you, he said. This one's for you and to have Joe and everything he's accomplished uh, think of that even at that time and you know you just won the World Series with a home run and he's got the presence to tell me that. It, it meant a lot to me to hear that. You know sometimes ball players particularly major league ball players professional athletes never have a chance to really say in a few words what it is to have a great teammate what it is to feel part of a team and in that moment to feel important sure. to someone else that's a really important thing for well, us, to say, us to say here you know after a lot of years as we talked about earlier to to have that uh, to really I, I don't know to earn respect of your teammates, especially after a transi transition to a new club. And I can't tell you how many guys, even after Joe, the rest of that night, made a point, uh, a special point of telling me that uh, you know, to be there, to watch me win my first one meant as much as almost winning to a lot of those guys. And, and that's something that uh, you know, I tried to absorb even three weeks hence, that, that it's just amazing to me that they would do that. You're on the field, and you're not one who's very emotional on the field 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, mm -hmm. but suddenly it all hits you and you start uncontrollably weeping on right. a field. Well, you run a full gamut of emotions in a very short time. There's no question that the run around the bases was just tremendously exciting. And uh, a lot of ways, it's, it's like that moment in the movie Major League where the guy bunts and it, everything goes into slow motion. You <laughs> run around the bases and you're high five in the third base coach, but it's just like. It's, it's slow, and then when you get to home plate, it's like back to, back to full speed, and they, now you hear the fireworks, and now you hear the crowd. Uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing how that all transpired. What's interesting is that in life, Paul, there are very few situations where one can run around the bases. In other words, the work is still to be done. You still have to touch the, right. the plate, right. but you get to celebrate even before it's officially done. And in front of the world, in front of 70,000, 60,000 fans at the stadium, yeah. That's an incredible, almost, you know, uncalculable kind of experience. Sure. Nothing else compares to it, almost. Sure. And I don't remember touching second or third. I'm glad they didn't appeal. I couldn't have argued. <laughs> but, uh, you know, after you score, you know, you talk about the emotion. And that's something that you can't, uh, you know, plan.
plan or prepare. You know, you're celebrating and you're in the pile. Next thing you know, you see a guy like Cito and the way that he treated me almost like a son this year. And, and for whatever reasons, uh, those emotions definitely do take over. Speaking of father and son, a surrogate father and son, Bud Selig was there throughout the series. Mm -hmm. A lot of emotion went down between you and he. Of course, uh, you, you didn't stick around in Milwaukee. He couldn't meet the, the salary issue. Uh, at the celebration in the clubhouse, he kissed you. Not a big wet kiss, folks, but a very <laughs> understated kiss. More of an embrace. And, and, you, and your wife said thank you to Bud. Um, could you feel for him and what he was going through all those yeah. years of wanting you to be the leader for his team sure. and then seeing it on another team? I don't think the thank you was meant to be a knock as much as we realize he had a big part in my career. And uh, just everything he's done, we, we, I, I still appreciate that. And to have him there, yes, there was a little bit of uncomfortableness about it. After, some tension. After everything and then what transpired last year. But we've continued to try to, to mend the... Uh, the the problems that took place and to have him there and I honestly believe he was happy for me to have the chance to win yes I'm sure he's disappointed that I wasn't in Milwaukee but uh, I believe he was sincere in his congratulations at some point you said to him I you were a victim of the system in in the sense that uh, even though you benefited from sure. the system the team you would have most liked to have stayed your whole career with did not uh, it, it didn't work out and you said to him it's too bad that the system wouldn't have worked out that way. Well, I was disappointed with the Brewers last winter, the way things went. And I think as time's gone by, I've gotten better perspective. And while the fans wanted to blame me or someone to blame Bud, uh, I've begun to have a much better understanding that it was more the system than any one individual or any, anything else. So uh, I think that's going to help us reestablish that relationship because, you know, it really wasn't anybody's fault. Will the system change? Will the Milwaukee Brewers of the world be able to benefit from something like revenue sharing? Do you think that's going to happen in our time? Well, the, the debates can get long and, and difficult, but I personally believe that there's going to be, have to be some revenue sharing amongst clubs for the smaller market teams to survive. I just hope that they don't expect the players to replace some of those revenues by accepting uh, certain caps and other proposals to compensate for the loss of dollars to the big market teams by helping the smaller market teams. Would you vote for Bud Selig for commissioner? That's the big rumor now, you know. I certainly would. I think that in some ways uh, I know he's committed to the Brewers and keeping them in Milwaukee. But I also realize that he has a uh, such a love and passion for baseball that he knows the problem it faces and maybe he feels deep inside that he might be able to be a guy to step forward and bring the ownership te teams together and uh, go ahead and provide a solid future for this game. Mm. We'll come back more with Paul Molitor from Minneapolis after this. Up Close is brought to you by Office Depot. Taking care of business with guaranteed low prices on thousands of brand name office supplies. By the original shower massage from Teledyne Waterpick. And by the Discover card. It pays to discover the card that pays you back. First time Paul Molitor met uh, Robin Yount, he called him Mr. Yount. I don't know how much <laughs> older Robin Yount was than Paul, but not much older. He may have been younger for all we know. Uh, your relationship, you used to have breakfast every single day for a stretch. And now he's in an interesting position, almost the same position you were in, although much advanced in his career. Sure. Uh, to stick around in Milwaukee, take less money, or to maybe hold out for a better situation. What advice would you give to Robin? Uh... I realize the uniqueness of a Robin Yao playing 20 years in one city and what he means to that community. Means to that community. Um, but I also know that in his heart he would like to have a chance to, to win. And I'm not sure if he feels Milwaukee will provide him that opportunity in a one-year situation. I would encourage him to uh, go ahead and see what's available out there. Mm -hmm. uh, see if Toronto calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. would you, and, uh, would, in the back of your mind, would that be a dream coming oh, to you? Uh, it would be awesome to me to have Robin come up there. Uh, I'd have to give up my number, give him that one, and <laughs> I'd switch to something else. But if that were to happen, we could be rejoined for another year. Uh, something I would really, really enjoy. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some other issues. Um, first of all, Robbie Alomar proved that you don't have to be... Uh, you could be a Canadian, I should say, and still make the big endorsement money, a million dollars a year in sure. endorsements. Toronto is every bit as, as you know, competitive in terms of lifestyle, living, endorsement deals for a ball player as anywhere else, right? Well, Toronto's a great city, and I'm spending the winter up there this year. Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it just has a lot to offer uh, culturally. Uh, it runs the gamut whenever you would like to, like to do it. Of course, the way they produce... Uh, 
you know, come out and support that team's incredible. Mm. And uh, Robbie's done very well, but why not? He's probably one of the best athletes in the game, and I think the people of Canada definitely appreciate what he's done for that organization. Then there is this. People say, well, Toronto was the reason, or, you know, the city of Toronto, the Can Canadian World Series, or partially, the reason the series didn't draw well on television. A couple of theories. There's no Nielsen ratings. Uh-huh. And therefore, the ratings can't be reflected better for, for a CBS who was ever covering the game. And that may be right, except that you realize the Blue Jays were in it last year and the ratings were 14% better. Why do you think the World Series, and it was a tremendous World Series, didn't do better on television? Well, I, I personally still believe that uh, the way that they've tried to, to run the games so late in prime time, it definitely has an effect. And... Um, the games go late, they go past midnight, and I think... One was close to one in the morning. After the rain delay, and uh, I think that's a big problem that's going to have to be addressed. And uh, also, maybe with Toronto, I think we're kind of getting a little bit of an image of the bad boys out there after mm -hmm. uh, the last couple of years. But for whatever reason, baseball in general has not done well television-wise the last couple of years during the regular season and postseason. Somehow on the new television contract, hopefully they can reestablish where they can start getting those things back on the rise. Does it cheapen the game, Paul, to have a wild card and extra tiers of playoffs, even though it's more money, more chance for a, for World Series revenue, et cetera, does it cheapen the game in the sense that the real pennant race is over? If I am given a vote, Roy, I will vote to leave it as is, no question. I might be a little bit more traditional on some of the players, and maybe I'm a little bit, uh, uh, you know, blinding to the fact that I know more revenue will be generated, but we're having enough trouble getting people to watch postseason as it is, and now you're going to break them up and regionalize them and uh, string the games out longer than October. Uh, I'm not sure if history will end up backing me up on this one, but I think uh, we're making a mistake in expanding the way we are. game did all right for 120 years, the way it it's, was. It's, pretty much. it's done very well, and I think that you get into a situation where they talk about going to 5-5-5 five, five, and five when they expand to 30, and then you have scheduling problems, and uh, I, ju I just think in the long run it's going to prove out to be a not very wise decision. Hmm. We're going to come back more with Paul Molitor from Minneapolis after this. It was once upon a time, maybe not long ago, right after he got out of St. Paul, uh, living on uh, Grand Avenue, <laughs> just as the kid, the dream came true, or started to come true anyway for Paul Molitor. And everybody figured he was going to be a can't-miss prospect, he was going to be a guy who was going to be a great Hall of Famer. Indeed, he may still be a Hall of Famer before it's over. But there was a period in your life where you didn't really believe too much in yourself and you put tremendous pressure on yourself and you couldn't handle it. Try to live up to other people's expectations. Reflect on that for a few moments. Well, I, I, if the period uh, you're alluding to is early in my career, and I think that um, when I finally got to Milwaukee and was labeled with that uh, uh, all-American boy type image, and, uh, you know, it just was a lot of pressure for, for me. And not to make excuses, I, I didn't handle it very well. The attention, the money, uh, the demands. And when I became injured and started missing some playing time, you know, I got, I got away from what had gotten me to the big leagues, and that was being dedicated and committed. I got involved with some substance abuse problems, uh, had to go through some trials in that area, some problems with relationships. And as I look back, you know, I, I, I can't change what happened, but, uh, you know, I, I'm very fortunate and blessed to have gotten through that and able to have gone on and played 16 years in the major leagues because I could have easily, as we've seen happen all the time, not only jeopardized my career, but my life in many ways. But were you, do you think, Paul, trying to wreck your career, trying to... to to dispel people's high in, high hopes for you in some way, Psycho I'm yeah. trying to get big psychological conversation. No, I, but do you think maybe you're trying to wreck it personal, personally? As, as I've had a chance to go out and speak and get more educated on, on why those problems occur, it, it runs, there's a lot of reasons I think that apply to me. It was not only escaping, but maybe trying to get some attention that I was a real person and I wasn't this robotical figure that could go out and perform uh, up to people's expectations. Mm. I think it reflected somewhat of some family situations and other things. But uh, the main thing is, I was able to get through and I have tried to use it in a positive light after all these years. And uh, for whatever reason, I went through that period. I, I think uh, it's turned out to have a positive effect on a lot of people's lives. Mm, I think so too, without question. How much do you think it's going to affect you though, in terms of the Hall of Fame balance? You know, I, I can't uh, begin to speculate on that. I, in fact, Hall of Fame talk didn't even come up until the last couple of years. That's right. For whatever, 2,500 hits though. For whatever reasons, I've gotten healthier and more productive as I've gotten older. So uh, as that's come up, uh, you know, the talk of that has kind of increased. It's not a motivation for me, Roy, really. I, 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 a couple of things that motivate me, I, I have a gift to play. I'm trying to maximize that gift. And the other thing is, 
I, I know what a blessing is to be a major league player and be able to compete, and I love to compete. So I'm going to try to continue to do it as long as I can. Mm. What is it about competition that fires you up? I mean, is it that you can measure it in a game where you can't... Re if you're selling shoes in another area of life, nothing wrong with selling shoes. It's a wonderful profession. Right. But you can't measure day to day what it is to win. You well, can sell shoes, but it's not the same thing. You can measure what you're doing every single and get the adulation to it. Well, there's something about sports that provides an instantaneous knowledge of results that I think that makes competition special to me. A lot of people's jobs, and they love their jobs, but when they do something, they don't know immediately, immediately how that's going to impact or if it's good or if it's bad. Maybe someone has to review their work. When you're on the field and you play, you know when the game's over. You know how you did, and that uh, is something that's special that adds to the, uh, you know, the uniqueness of professional sports. And um, you know, I'd, you think about the atmosphere of Major League Parks and uh, the jobs we have and the way we're taken care of. It's just a job that I've learned not to take for granted. And you throw in all those things together, and uh, you know, it makes you hungry to continue to go out there and work to play. It makes you, you, more humble. Not for everybody. Why do you think the more you accomplish, it seems to me. Mm -hmm the more humble you get. Well, I think the more I've learned over the years that, uh, you know, we talked about some of the personal problems I had when I first came up, and you talk about missing 500 games with injuries. Uh, I've just come to a much better understanding uh, that I, don't, I didn't have a lot to do with my ability to hit baseball. I've worked hard at, at perfecting it, but I can't take a lot of credit for that gift. Yeah, I've tried to get a lot out of myself, but um, I just think that, you know, people blow smoke at themselves that, you know, yes, I do this and yes, I do that. They, they forget where some of their abilities come from. Mm. Also, the fact is that they do one thing real well in their lives and they are paid handsomely for it. And the response, the adulation is disproportionate, disproportionate to other sure. things in life. But that is just one thing, albeit a great thing. There are other great things sure. that people can do in their lives, but don't get the credit. I, I had a talk with my daughter in uh, Toronto at 4.30 in the morning after a World Series game about adulation and how uh, it comes with the territory, but don't be fooled by it. Because uh, when it comes down the road uh, in 15 years, now a lot of people remember who was the MVP of the 93 World Series, and I'm going to have to go down with my life. And while she gets a false impression of maybe who her dad is, it's important to keep, keep your hands on the situation with your kids because uh, things go on a lot longer in baseball. Mm. Life's a long time beyond the playing career. We'll come back some final thoughts with Paul Molitor from Minneapolis after this. Travel arranged through Continental. One airline can make a difference. One pass lets you earn free travel faster than any other airline. That's the difference on Continental. Paul Molitor has been called the deer that made Milwaukee famous. Uh, they loved him in Milwaukee. They still do in many circles. Um, love him not just because of the fact that he was a great baseball player and still is, but really love him and his wife, Linda, for the work that they did in the Milwaukee area in two particular causes. One, uh, cancer, particularly as it impacts children, and AIDS. When you left Milwaukee, one of the people who was uh, running uh, the Children's Cancer Fund, uh, John Gray, I think it is. John Kerry. Kerry, I'm right. sorry. Uh, wept. I mean, it was a tremendous mm -hmm. loss for the community because of all the involvements you had. Let's talk about why that particular cause was so very important to you and remains so today. Well, uh, you know, uh, being in the spotlight, you have a lot of chances to help a lot of different organizations, and it's tough to do them all. But when you go through a, a children's hospital and see kids in the cancer ward and the helplessness they have in uh, the choice of suffering to that degree, it's not hard to want to go out and find a way to try to help those kids improve their hopes of surviving. And that's what the MAC Fund, Milwaukee Athletes Against Childhood Cancer, was all about. So we spent a lot of time, as did a lot of athletes, trying to raise dollars. And thankfully over the years, the, the cure rate has risen. So the work is uh, prospering and giving those kids hope. Your quote was, it takes a lot more guts to walk into a kid's room when he's dying of cancer than it does to stand in the plate against Nolan Ryan. Well, uh, you know, a lot of ways it's, uh, it's so true. I mean, I can go out and I can face Nolan or uh, Goose Gossage or some of the hardest throws in baseball and have a blast. These kids aren't having any fun. And when you go in there and walk through their rooms and see the, the reality of, of what, the, what they're facing, right, it just helps uh, put that perspective into place. How about AIDS? Why AIDS? How did it affect you? Well, it really hasn't had a personal effect on me yet, but I have been affected from afar in terms of realizing a lot of the myths 
that we've put on the AIDS uh, situation. And uh, I just have felt in Milwaukee, uh, I was asked to get involved, uh, as was Linda, and, and we did some things to help raise money in that area too. I just think it's time for people to stop, uh, you know, categorizing uh, that particular disease and realize we all have to fight it before it overtakes more people than we're willing to lose. And mm -hmm. uh, the numbers are growing so fast, it's time to try to turn that situation around. Mm -hmm. You came from a very large family, seven kids, right. military, militaristic kind of high school, very, very strict, yes right. sir, no sir, no nonsense. And you're still that kid though, playing ball in front of that fence in some ways, in St. Paul, mm -hmm. where the ball's thrown up on the fence and you try to make the catch. How do you keep the kid alive as long as you play the game? Is it hard? Is it easy? Uh, for me, it's pretty easy when I'm on the field. When I wake up in the morning after some days, I go, there's no way I can get this body to play tonight. But somehow through adrenaline and uh, uh, stretching and just getting ready, you get out there and you're ready to play. And then after the game, I'll look at some tape and I'll say, man, you're still head first sliding. What are you doing out there? You're 37 years old. But uh, for whatever reason, right, when I get out there and I play the game, uh, the kid definitely takes over. And I hope I don't ever lose that as long as I continue to put the uniform on. There's an old saying that says, you don't stop playing because you grow old. You grow old because you stop playing. Mm. That's, I'd like to uh, hopefully be uh, a living example of that. Uh, <laughs> I had a chance to rock. Pete Rose was one of my favorite players growing up, and there's no question that he was uh, probably the guy that that quote came after. So I try to live up to that. You do every single day. Paul Molitor, thank you. Good okay. seeing you again. You too. Okay. We'll come back, wrap things up up close after this. We thank our guest, Paul Molitor, the Toronto Blue Jays, for joining us up close. We'll see you next time, everybody. Up Close is brought to you by Smooth Bush Beer and Easy Drinking Bush Life. And by Smooth Operator Wet Dry Razors from Panasonic. Smoother than you'd ever thought you'd be.